In this video I draw parallels between Paul and Leonard Howell. Howell was a founding figure in the Rastafarian religion, and he wrote one of their sacred texts, The Promised Key, which considers the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie to be a godman. It is a spiritual work and only refers to events in the life of Haile Selassie insofar as they have spiritual significance. A bit like Paul only referring to crucifixion in the life of Jesus because it has spiritual significance. Unlike Paul, Howell is quite clear about the historicity of Haile Selassie, but makes no reference to his life, belief, sayings or deeds. If you apply the arguments put by mythicists about the silence of Paul to the promised key, you find they fit. But in the case of the promised key, we know Haile Selassie existed. I explain why Howell does not refer to Selassie's actual beliefs and sayings, and argue that this explanation can also apply to Paul and it explains why he didn't discuss an earthly Jesus even if there was one. As an aside, in the context of theological thought, the message of Rastafarian belief is comparable to that of Christianity with comparable Old Testament support, not that that's saying very much. But Christians who dismiss Rastafarianism should look first to the motes in their own eyes. Rastafarianism is a very interesting religion. It dates from 1930s Jamaica, but it has older roots. Much of Jamaica's population was originally brought from Africa as slaves. Slavery was abolished by the British Empire in 1834, but the African community in Jamaica remained underprivileged and disenfranchised from government. The nearby United States saw significant Christian revivalism in the 19th and early 20th centuries, characterised by a rejection of European established religions and a return to biblical fundamentalism. This movement affected Jamaica also, and many of African extraction saw parallels between their own situation and that of the Israelites in exile in Babylon. This led to the view of Africa being the promised land of the African diaspora, suffering under the yoke of oppression in foreign lands. And that a return to Africa was the way out of this situation. This temporal and geographical aspiration was mixed with spirituality of fundamentalist Christian origin. The nation of Ethiopia had a particular significance in this scheme. It is mentioned in the Christian Bible 24 times and not counting Sheba. It has one of the most ancient unbroken lines of independent Christian tradition. Ethiopia was one of the first countries to adopt Christianity as the national religion in the 4th century and has adhered to its Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, which has some variations in canon as well as theology from other Christian groups. The Ethiopians and Ottomans sparred for control of the Red Sea coast in the 15th to 17th centuries, but the Ottomans never got the better of them and the country was never Islamicised. Then there is the Solomonic dynasty. Here in 1 Kings 10.13 King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba everything she requested besides what he had freely offered her. Then she left and returned to her homeland with her attendants. The location of Sheba is not known for sure, with Islamic tradition placing it in Yemen in southwestern Arabia. Josephus and Ethiopian tradition have it across the Red Sea in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian version of the biblical story involves some subterfuge, with Solomon agreeing not to seduce the queen as long as she took nothing from his palace. She gets thirsty and takes a glass of water. So where 1 Kings 10.13 refers to Solomon giving the Queen of Sheba everything she requested besides what he had freely offered to her, this included a gamete, and Melanic I, the founder of the Ethiopian Solomonic dynasty, was the result, something that's not that difficult to read into the rest of the 1 Kings 10 account, and Solomon had a family history of this kind of thing. Tafari Makonan was born into the Solomonic Ethiopian imperial line on 23 July 1892. He was given the christening name of Haile Selassie, but was initially known as Tafari. In 1917 he assumed the title Ras, meaning head, a high rank in the Ethiopian feudal hierarchy, hence Ras Tafari. In 1930 he was crowned emperor of Ethiopia by the British, the then rulers, and used Haile Selassie as his regional name. In October 1935, the Italian army attacked Ethiopia from Eritrea and Somalia, starting the brutal Second Italo-Ethiopian War. 
Selassie himself joined the fighting but was defeated and was forced into exile, leaving for Jerusalem in May 1936. He then went to Bath in England until 1940, when he joined the Allied campaign to liberate Ethiopia. Italian forces were defeated by a multinational army of Ethiopian Patriot, British, British Commonwealth, French and Belgian forces, and Selassie re-entered Addis Ababa in May 1941. He remained emperor until 1974, when he was ousted by the Soviet-backed Derg, the communist committee of the then mutinying army. He was kept under house arrest until his death in 1975. That was initially reported to be from natural causes, but historical records show clearly that he was murdered by strangulation on the orders of the Derg. Understandably, these events led to a theological crisis within Rastafarianism, which evolved from a belief system with a large temporal and geographical component to one which was essentially spiritual. Does that sound familiar? Leonard Howell was born on 16 June 1898 into a rural community in Bullhead Mountains in the centre of Jamaica. During World War I he worked as a seaman which took him away from Jamaica. He went to New York where he joined Marcus Garvey's Universal African Improvement Association or UNIA and became one of his leading members. Garvey preached that the African diaspora should look towards Ethiopia for the crowning of a king who would lead them out of white domination. Garvey was deported back to Jamaica in 1928 after being arrested by US authorities because of his teachings. Howell was also arrested and imprisoned. In 1932 he too was deported back to Jamaica, where he continued teaching and preaching. He founded Rastafarianism in Jamaica in 1932, after Haile Selassie's coronation, and by 1933 he had elevated Selassie from an emperor to messianic godman status. Selassie was not amused by this, and found it an embarrassment being himself an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian. Hal preached that Africans were the chosen people and would soon return to Ethiopia. This was seen as seditious by the colonial authorities, and he was again arrested. In March 1934, he was sentenced to two years in prison, where he wrote The Promised Key. The Promised Key is a text of a bit over 5,000 words. It is an edited shorter version of the Royal Parchment Scroll of Black Supremacy. Howell's key innovation was to identify King Alpha and Queen Omega with Emperor Haile Selassie and his wife Menen Astor, Empress of Ethiopia from 1930 to 1962 whereas the Royal Parchment Scroll had identified them with Fitzballantine Petersburg and his wife. Howell was released from prison in 1936 and continued preaching and publishing a newspaper, The People's Voice. His doctrines were viewed as anti-church and anti-government. In 1938, he was certified as insane because of what he had written in The Promised Key and sent to Bellevue Asylum in Kingston, Jamaica. He was released in 1940 when he set up the first Jamaican Rastafarian community of self-sufficient farmers. Other communities followed. They were subject to regular raids and dislocations by the authorities and police. He was arrested in 1941 and sentenced to prison for sedition again. He was released in 1943 and returned to his preaching and leadership role. In 1954, government forces invaded the Pinnacle, his mission compound, and completely destroyed it, burning his books. Howell wasn't only a target of the colonial government, but was also persecuted by the press, churches, labour leaders, the Creole nationalist movement, as well as civilians of all racial groups. He was arrested at least 40 times and became known as the most persecuted Rastafarian. Does that sound familiar? He died in obscurity in February 1981 at the age of 82, after spending the last 20 years of his life as a recluse. Rastafarianism rose to international prominence in the 1970s thanks to music. The song The Rivers of Babylon is about Rastafarian theology and was written in 1970 by the Jamaican reggae group The Melodians. It was later made famous at the hands of Boney M., Bob Marley was also a Rastafarian, though he was baptised into Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity shortly before his death. Reggae music generally was closely connected with Rastafarianism. 
The huge success of this musical tradition, and Bob Marley in particular, led to a peak in membership. A few thousand members of the African diaspora did move back to Africa under Rastafarian influence during this period. Unlike Paul, Howell is not silent about the historicity of Haile Selassie. He clearly places him in historical time, geographical space, and recounts his coronation in detail. The promised key opens with... In 1930, the Duke of Gloucester undertook one of the most interesting duties he had ever been called upon to execute up to this date. The occasion was the coronation of His Majesty Rastafare, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the conquering Lion of Judah, the elect of God and the light of the world. The Duke was to represent his father, the Anglo-Saxon King. The Duke handed to His Majesty Rastafari, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a sceptre of solid gold, 27 inches long, which had been taken from the hands of Ethiopia some thousand years ago. The Duke fell down on bending knees before His Majesty Rastafari, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and spoke in a loud voice and said, Master, Master, my father has sent me to represent him, sir. He is unable to come, and he said that he will serve you to the end, Master. See Psalm 72, 9 to 11 verses. Also see Genesis 49, chapter 10 verse. Howell wasn't there at the coronation and got his information from press reports. He goes on to attribute several earthly sayings to Selassie. Here are examples. Mount Africa, the world's capital, the new Bible land, the triumphant lot is for King Alpha, own lot until this day. Slave traders called the world's capital Jamaica, British West Indies. Before the Adamic deadly diseases poisoned the human family with fallen angels, blue murders, there has been only one perfect language on the face of the globe. Therefore the Anglo-militant fallen angel tongues are not appreciated by his majesty King Alpha, the monarch of life. Thus said Rastafari, the living God to creation. Another example, His Majesty Rastafari, the Bible owner of Holy Times, denounce the Bible militant, also the militant dictionary, and take off the black man his posterity from off the Anglo-militant slave train at nationality and planted the church triumphant. And a final example, His Majesty Rastafari said, Now, sweetheart, my dearest wonder, just take this drench of perfect wonders and live with me for life. What Howell attributes to him is not derived from what Haile Selassie is on record to have said, but rather from Howell's source literature and his own theology. Howell includes nothing about what Selassie actually believed or said. We're much clearer about the reason Howell includes nothing about what Selassie actually believed or said than we are for Paul and Jesus. Haile Selassie was an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian. He neither founded nor believed in Rastafarianism. Howell identified Selassie as a messianic figure not because of his teachings or beliefs, but because his life events, specifically his coronation, paralleled what Howell was expecting from his own theology. Howell's relationship to Selassie was not one of a disciple or apostle, but what I'll call a Howellist, in that Leonard Howell Howellized Haile Selassie by using his figure and historical circumstances in his theology but without any reference or interest to Selassie's actual teachings or beliefs. If Paul similarly Howellized Jesus, then it explains why he had nothing to say about his earthly deeds or teachings. To my mind, this is a much more convincing explanation of Paul's silence than those usually offered by historicists, which are variations on three arguments. The first is seizing on Paul's ambiguous comments about Jesus' life and asserting a degree of confidence that they are historical references that the evidence doesn't justify. Second is waffling about high and low context societies, a lame excuse for Paul's failure to mention Jesus' teachings based on the idea that in ancient times there was no readily accessible information store like libraries or the internet, so people carried around in their heads what they knew. That meant Paul could assume his audience had knowledge in common with him and so he didn't mention it. Not a credible argument. The third one is that these were occasional letters where Paul did not write to explain his theology but to address specific issues that had arisen in his churches. Another weak argument. 
I find Howellization a much stronger argument, though not one that's going to be attractive to Christians, because it denies Jesus' role as the founder of Christianity, and rather makes Paul the founder. This also gives a different motivation to the scramble amongst early Christian writers to fabricate a fantastical story about Jesus. They weren't trying to euhemerize him. They were trying to make him replace Paul as the founder of their religion. The silence of Paul is the reason why there is a Christ myth theory, and it remains mythicism's strongest argument. A credible counter to that argument is therefore a significant blow to mythicism, which is why it seems to me that the howlization of Haile Selassie is a fairly strong steer towards historicity,